بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله اما بعد فان احسن الكلام كلام الله وخير الهدى هدى محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وان شر الامور محدثاتها وكل محدثه بدعه وكل بدعه ضلاله وكل ضلاله في النار ان شاء الله in this uh, series of lessons uh, we're going to go through an explanation of al-nawawi's 40 hadith uh, the, the well known and famous al-arba'in al-nawawiyya the 40 hadith compiled by al-nawawi and this explanation is taken from uh, the noble Sheikh, Sheikh Saleh, al Sheikh, and he has an explanation which is not, uh, it's not like a detailed and exhaustive explanation of uh, 40 hadith, it's more, uh, it, it's a type of explanation where it highlights the principles and the, you know, which are found in these hadith, so he highlights the various uh, principles, the, 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 the usul and the qawaid, you know, the, the foundations and the principles which he uh, highlights and extracts from, the, from these ahadith. And in his, and this explanation initially was a series of uh, recorded lessons, and I have here with me the, the, the printed version, the book. And in the introduction, the author, the uh, Sheikh Salih al Sheikh, he mentions a few uh, points. Uh, from them is the issue, the, gen the general issue of uh, seeking knowledge and how uh, a student of knowledge, that basically the, the, the way that he should seek knowledge is to do it in stages and in, you know, in progressive stages, in small uh, steps. And uh, this is, you know, this is better for, a, in terms of a person be ga being able to retain the knowledge because as uh, the Imam Ibn Shihab al-Zuhri uh, and Sheikh Saleh al Sheikh quotes from him, he said that whoever acquires knowledge in a single go, man rama al-ilma jumlatan, dhahaba anhu jumlatan. That whoever acquired knowledge in a single go, he will lose it in a single go. Wa innama yutlabu al-ilm ala marri al-ayyam wal-layali. That indeed knowledge is sought, over the passing of days and, and, and nights. So the Sheikh says that a student of knowledge who should begin with the you know the, 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 the small books, you know, the short and the small books which mention the Usul, the, 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 the foundations, and you know he, he acquires this knowledge you know in, 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 in like small stages. And when he proceeds in this manner, then he will be able to, like, just for example, like he does with reading and with speaking, you know, he begins first of all with, you know, uh, the, the basic sounds or with the basic, you know, the, 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 the writing. And then over time, as he improves stead steadily and in stages, he then becomes very precise in his, in his speech and in, you know, being able to write. So knowledge is exactly the same. It's just like a person learning to speak and a person learning to write. It's exactly the same. Uh, that knowledge, that from knowledge are those which are the, the, the small aspects of knowledge. And from, from knowledge are those which are the, the, great, you know, the great and the serious elements of knowledge which, you know, which require a great deal of understanding. And so the, 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 the Sheikh says that the, the reason why this is the case because this knowledge itself is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and from the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So in that sense, there is nothing from this knowledge which, is really the, which we consider to be light and easy in the sense that it, it, it's light and you know, something insignificant. Uh, um, and the, the, the Sheikh mentions a, a narration a quotation from Imam Malik, rahimahullah, uh, when it was said to him, uh, this, that some issue w was mentioned, and it was said to him, هَذَا مِنَ الْعِلْمِ أَسَّهُمْ That this knowledge, this is from the easy knowledge, or the, or the, or the light knowledge. And so the Imam Malik replied, 
uh, there is nothing in the knowledge of the Quran or the Sunnah which is easy or which is which is light. Rather, it is as Allah, the Mighty Majestic, said, "Inna sanulki alika qawlan thaqila." Indeed, we shall uh, send upon you, or th- you know, send upon you, qawlan uh, thaqila, a very weighty word or a heavy word. So the Sheikh says that knowledge, um, the the Sheikh says that uh, that the person, uh, the the, the, yeah, the Sheikh then makes a point from this uh, quotation. He says that the knowledge, when a person has this view of knowledge, that it's something that that is weighty and heavy and and you know and 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 uh, perhaps ha- has an element of difficulty towards it, then he will indeed acquire this knowledge. Right, if, 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 he, if he gives this, uh, if he has this perception of knowledge. And as for the person who, 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 who treats issues as if, as if they're like very light and very easy, so he, says, so, he, so he says, for example, this is easy and this is understood and this is, you know, imaginable and this is understood and whatever. And then in this manner, you know, he, he, he passes through it like as if it's, you know, very quickly and very hastily. Then this person, he will lose a great deal. You know, he a great deal will pass by him, and he won't even you know uh, acquire it. So the Sheikh then says that basically uh, emphasizing again that when we seek knowledge, then it's important that we seek it in stages, and in gradual stages, and we have a, a very clear methodology that we follow when we when when we seek uh, knowledge, and um, that we don't treat it as if knowledge is something very light and easy, and um, you know. Uh, when we treat knowledge as if it's serious, something that's weighty, something that's heavy, something in which difficulty is involved, then this is, is better in terms of being able to understand it and being able to remain firm upon it and being able to continue, you know, uh, as, 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 you know as, as, as a student of, of knowledge. Um, and the Sheikh says that knowledge, if it's not attended to and a person doesn't, you know, keep uh, attending to it, then it will be lost. Yeah, it, will, it will eventually uh, be lost. And so then the Sheikh, after this, he says, uh, speaking now specifically about this book, uh, he introduces this book and he says that this particular book, uh, the book that he's going to, uh, whose explanation he's going to begin, he says that um, the author of this book is the uh, Imam, the Allama Yahya bin Sharaf al-Nabawi, and it has also been said that his uh, Al-Nawawi, uh, Al-Nawawi or Al-Nawawi, uh, there's two ways um, to, 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 uh, for, for the mentioning of that name. And he says that he's from the Shafi'i scholars. He's from the well-known and the prominent scholars amongst the Shafi'iya. And uh, he, he, he wrote many explanations uh, of books on Hadith and books on Fiqh. And likewise in the uh, language of the jurists and other than that. And the reason why this book came about was that another scholar by the name of Ibn al-Salah, Ibn al-Salah, rahimahullah, and he was another uh, well-known famous scholar and a muhaddith, what he did was he sat together in, he used to have gatherings in which he used to sit together in order to teach hadith. And what he did was he compiled a, a, a collection of hadith together in which the principles of the Sharia or the knowledge of the Sharia is summarized, right? A hadith which, you know, around which the whole of the Sharia and the usul of the Sharia are based. So the hadith that he put together was 16 in number. Uh, sorry, he, uh, 26 in number. He brought together 26 hadith, you know, which, which, which he considered to be, uh, you know, summarizing or containing the broad principles of the Sharia as a whole. And then uh, the uh, Imam al nawawi rahimahullah, he came and he added another 16 on top, right? Because so he felt there was another 16 that, you know, need to be added. Uh, so altogether this made 42 hadith. And these, th- these are what we have today in uh, the book Al-Arba'een and Nawawiyah. There are in fact 42 hadith. And then after Imam al nawawi there came... Uh, the Imam Abdul Rahman bin Ahmad ibn Rajab al Hambali, and what he did was he added a further eight. He added a further eight, which again were a hadith which, which contained 
uh, f uh, fundamental broad uh, principles of, of the religion uh, around which the whole of the Sharia revolves and so therefore it became 50 hadith and the, the 50 hadith are found in the book of uh, 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 Ibn Rajab al-Hanbali called Jami al-Ulum wal-Hikam wal-Hikam fi sharh 50 hadithan min juwami il min juwami il kalam uh, and this is again another, another uh, uh, well-known book and it's actually quite a detailed and exhaustive explanation of Annawi's with 40 hadith and um, the Sheikh says that the reason why these ahadith uh, are considered to be so important is because from them when we look at them we find that some of them um, uh, the, you know, there's no issue of the issues of the religion except that you will find it in these ahadith whether it will be discussing the subject of aqidah, uh, creed, or jurisprudence, fiqh, or you know the issues of halal and haram and so on and so forth, then you will find them, broadly speaking, to be mentioned in, 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 in these hadith. Um, so the Sheikh says, finally, just summarizing that uh, to be concerned with these hadith is, is very uh, important uh, because to understand them, is, is, is understanding the foundations of the religion in general and the principles of the religion in general and because some of them uh, also relate to the, the, the rulings right so some of them relate to you know, um, uh, the, the affairs of aqidah and the affairs of fiqh and other than that and some of them relate to the actual rulings in the religion uh, as well so with that introduction we'll commence the first hadith and the first hadith, as you are all aware, is the well-known, famous hadith, the hadith of uh, Amir al-Mu'mineen, Umar ibn al-Khattab, Umar ibn al-Khattab, radiyallahu anhu, uh, which is a hadith of intention. Indeed, actions are by intention. So the hadith, the text of the hadith from Amir al-Mu'mineen, uh, and Amir al-Mu'mineen, Abi Hafsin, Umar ibn al-Khattab, radiyallahu anhu, who said, قال سمعت رسول رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم يقول that he heard the messenger of Allah صلى الله عليه وسلم say إنما الأعمال بالنيات وإنما لكل امرئ ما نوى indeed actions are but by intention and indeed every man shall have that which he intended فمن كانت هجرته إلى الله ورسوله فهجرته إلى الله ورسوله ومن كانت هجرته لدنيا يصيبها أو امرأة ينكحها فهجرته إلى مهاجر إليه. and who, who, so therefore whoever made emigration whoever's emigration to Allah was was to, um, uh, was to Allah and His Messenger then his emigration is indeed to Allah and His Messenger and whoever emigrate who, whoever's emigration was for the purpose of the world to acquire a portion of it or in order to offer a woman that he wanted in marriage, that he wanted to marry, then his emigration is for that for which he emigrated. And this hadith is reported by, narrated by uh, Imam al-Bukhari and Muslim, Imam Muslim in their two uh, books of hadith, the two sahihs. And the Sheikh, Sheikh Salih al Sheikh, begins by saying that this hadith is, is the first hadith, the hadith of Umar ibn al Khattab, anhu, that he heard the, the Prophet وسلم, say, Innama al a'malu bin niyat wa innama li kulli mri'im ma nawa. And this hadith is a great and mighty hadith to such a degree that a group from the Salaf, a group from the Salaf, and likewise a group from the scholars of the religion thereafter, they said that this hadith, it's desirable that this hadith is placed, uh, is at the beginning of every single book from the books of knowledge. Right? It's desirable for this hadith to be placed at the beginning uh, of every single book from the books of knowledge. And this is why Imam al-Bukhari, rahimahullah, he began uh, his, his collection, his compilation with this particular hadith, and so he made this hadith, إِنَّمَا الْأَعْمَالُ بِالنِّيَاتِ وَإِنَّمَا لِكُلِّ مْرِئٍ مَا نَوَى to be the very first hadith. Um, and as for the hadith then, this hadith is an asal, is a foundation from the foundations of the religion. And Imam Ahmed, rahimahullah, 
Imam Ahmad stated that there are three ahadith around which the whole of Islam revolves. And there are three ahadith around which Islam revolves. The hadith of Umar, which is this hadith, إِنَّمَا الْأَعْمَالُ بِالنِّيَاتِ Indeed, actions are but by intention. The hadith of Aisha, رضي الله عنها, مَنْ أَحْدَثَ فِي أَمْرِنَا هَذَا مَا لَيْسَ مِنْهُ فَهُوَ رَدْ That whoever introduced something into this affair of ours, something which doesn't belong to it, then it is rejected. And the hadith of Al-Nu'man bin Bushair, uh, which is Al-Halal Ubayyin Wal-Haram Ubayyin. That the halal is clear and manifest, and the haram is clear and manifest. And between them both are affairs which are ambiguous, that, that, that hadith. So this is a statement of Imam Ahmed, where he said that these three hadith, the whole of Islam revolves around them. And the Shaykh says that this statement from this Imam, from Imam Ahmad, the Imam of Ahlul Sunnah, is, you know, it's extremely, uh, you know, uh, deep and uh, profound in the sense that, and then the Shaykh goes on to explain why, or he goes on to give an explanation of the statement of Imam Ahmad. He says this is because that a person, his actions, the action of a person who is tasked and responsible for acting upon the upon the Sharia, uh, that his actions revolve around either doing that which he's been commanded, or keeping away from that which he's been prohibited. Right. So a person, his actions are always it's either doing something which he's been commanded, or keeping away from something which he has been prohibited. And either of these things, the, 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 this is actually synonymous with the halal and the haram. You know, the halal and the haram. Right? So, so in other words, all of the actions of a servant, they revolve around the, the, the halal and the haram. And then, between the halal and between the haram, there are obviously uh, some ambiguous matter, ambiguous affairs and ambiguous issues. And this is the third category. So we have the halal. We have the haram, we have in the middle ambiguous affairs. And that's why in this hadith, this hadith mentions all three. The hadith of Al-Nu'man bin Bashir. Because in the hadith there occurs Al-Halal Ubayyin wal Haram Ubayyin wa Baynahuma Umurun Mushtabihatun. That the halal is manifest, the haram is manifest and clear. And between them both are affairs which are ambiguous. Um, and so... So therefore, we can see that this hadith has comprised or it contains all of the actions, right? It's got the halal and the haram and the, you know, the, even the affairs which are ambiguous, right? So that, that therefore covers all of the actions that, that a person uh, can, can perform. Next, next, these actions that we perform outwardly, right? Those things which are obligatory, those things that we've been commanded, uh, so therefore we, we perform them and those things that we've been prohibited from, so therefore we keep away from them. Then whether these actions are correct or not, right? the correctness of these actions, which this hadith of an numan bin Bushair has mentioned, these actions, the correctness of these actions depends upon um, the existence of the niyyah, the existence of the intention. Right? So the existence of the intention or the intention itself and the nature of that intention will either make these outward actions, it will either make them acceptable and righteous, right? Or it will make them unacceptable and not righteous. Unacceptable. Right? So, so the existence of this niya is, is such that it will make actions correct and accepted or other than that right so so the sheikh says on top of this on top of this we have the actions themselves we have the niya and then on top of this these actions that we've been asked to perform which Allah has made obligatory from the wajibat you know from the obligatory affairs or the mustahabbat you know the the, the, the recommended affairs um, then there has to be some sort of scales of balance there has to be some sort of outward balance by which we can judge an action to be correct 
right? The outward action when the when it's performed. There has to be a balance, or there has to be a scale. Otherwise, you know, any action could be considered to be to be to be uh, righteous and, and worship. And this is why the third hadith, the hadith of Aisha, man amila amalan nisa alihi amruna fahu amruna fahu rad. That whoever did an action which is not you know, is not in agreement with our uh, affair, then it is rejected. This is a hadith reported by Muslim, similar in wording to the hadith that was mentioned earlier on. And this hadith outlines or uh, explains that there's a criterion for acceptance of these actions, which is whatever, you know, is in accordance with the sunnah. So these three uh, hadith, when you bring them all together, the outward actions, the halal and the haram, and what a Muslim performs, then the validity of those actions based upon the niyyah itself, right, the correctness of the intention, and then the manner in which these actions are performed, are they in accordance with the sunnah or not, right? This is why you can see that this, this essentially covers the whole of, of, of Islam in the sense that it deals with ikhlas, sincerity to Allah in actions. It deals with all of the actions themselves, the meaning everything that comes into iman, all of the actions. And it, uh, it it deals with the 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 uh, following of the sunnah and making ittiba of the sharia as opposed to what is besides it. So worshiping Allah based upon what He Himself legislated, as opposed to worshiping Him uh, based upon that which He didn't legislate. So this this is why the statement of Imam Malik, uh, Imam Ahmad, rahimahullah, is very profound in the sense that he stated that you know these three hadith, the whole of Islam, revolves around them. So then the Shaykh continues and he says that this hadith, the hadith of actions, the inna the a'malu bin niyat, the hadith, indeed actions are by intention, that a Muslim, that a person, he is in need of it in every single thing. Right? So whether it is, he's in need of it, for example, in, um, in uh, acting upon the things which he's been commanded with, and in keeping away from the prohibitions, and in keeping away from the mushtabihat, the, the, the ambiguous matters. And uh, this is why this hadith is very, you know, very important. Uh, because no matter what situation a person might be in, uh, you know, in any of the affairs, like for example, he might, be, he might be facing an obligation, he might be facing or doing something which is mustahab, he might be uh, facing something which is prohibited, which is haram, Right, so he keeps away from it, or it might be disliked in the Sharia, right? Or he, or the affair could be something that's like ambiguous or not clear, so he abandons it. No matter what situation of all of these situations a man is in or a person is in, right? He's faced with all of these different types of uh, situations. Then uh, he cannot be considered to be righteous in any of those situations meaning in relation to a wajib or a mustahab or keeping away from something which is haram or from which is makruh or something which is ambiguous so he keeps away from it in all these uh, scenarios then he will never be considered to be righteous unless he has this w desire of seeking the face of Allah the mighty and majestic by way of that action and this is what is called the intention this is the niyyah this is the niyyah the existence of this niyyah that he seeks, that he desires the face of Allah, the mighty and majestic. So this is why uh, so the, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, إِنَّمَا الْأَعْمَالُ uh, Indeed, actions that were by intention. It's also been narrated in an alternative way, إِنَّمَا uh, الْعَمَلُ بِالنِّيَّةِ Indeed, action is by intention. This is in the singular, in the, in the, in the first version. إِنَّمَا الْأَعْمَالُ Indeed, actions, which are in the plural, بِالنِّيَّاتِ By intentions, in the plural. Here, إِنَّمَا إِنَّمَا الْعَمَلُ بِالنِّيَّاتِ And likewise, in another version, إِنَّمَا الْأَعْمَالُ بِالنِّيَّاتِ Indeed, actions are by in the intention. So, there are different wordings, but the meaning is, is the same. Uh, when, you know, in, in, in the case where the, where the single form is used, إِنَّمَا الْعَمَلُ بِالنِّيَّاتِ then what is meant by here is the general species of action right the action meaning actions in general in the mal'amal of binniya indeed action is by intention but what is meant by action here means all action so it covers all of the all of the action so despite the variation in the wording the meaning is exactly the same 
And then this statement of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, "Inna mal a'amalu bin niyat," then um, the, 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 this, the, the meaning here is because of the particle that's used, innama, innama at the beginning. So instead of just saying al a'malu bin niyat, the messenger said, innama al a'malu bin niyat. And this particle or this word at the beginning, innama, then it, it's a particle which is used in order to denote um, comprehension. Uh, to, you know, to, 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 to comprehension on the one hand or you know, a restriction on, 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 on the other hand. So, for example, what it means here is that all of the actions, so first of all, it, it covers all actions, right, comprehensively covers all actions. And secondly, that it, it means that actions are, are tied to the, to, the, to the intentions. They are restricted to the intentions, right? So meaning that the outcome of the action is restricted to the, to the underlying intention, right? So meaning... Meaning that actions are restricted to, to, to the intentions uh, behind them and the intentions behind them determine the true nature of these actions. And then we find that uh, the scholars have basically two broad uh, opinions or two, two viewpoints regarding the meaning of this first statement إِنَّ مَا الْأَعْمَالُ بِالنِّيَاتِ uh, so some of the scholars say that what it means that what is meant here by actions of Abu by intention that it means that the acceptance of an action and an action being correct is based upon the intention. Right? So this is this is the first view. Right? That what this hadith means or what this wording means is that the actions themselves, their correctness and their accept their acceptability is based upon the intention behind them. And and as for the second part, wa innama likullim ma nawa, then what this means is that a person will be rewarded for the action that he did in accordance with the intention behind it. Right? So the actual reward actual reward is based upon the intention behind uh, that action. So the first half so the first half of the hadith, innama la ma'lu bin niyat explains that actions are restricted in the, in the way that they are treated and judged by the intentions behind them. In the second half, that every man will be rewarded based upon what he actually uh, intended. And so then the Shia continues and he says, likewise the lamb in wa innama likullim ma nawa innama wa innama likullim ma nawa that the lamb here Likullim written that this lamb is it denotes the uh, the, the lamb of possession in the sense uh, in, in a similar sense to when Allah says in the Quran wa anna laysa lil insani illa ma sa'a that man shall have nothing that there is nothing for man except that which he strived for so this in this hadith the wording is the same wa inna ma likullim written ma nawa meaning that the reward of his action uh, that, that that's what he will possess. That's what he will receive. Right. So whatever he intended by way of his action, then that reward will be his. Then that will be his. He will be. He 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 will receive that reward. This is a statement of a group of the scholars um, regarding this opening part of the hadith. Another group of scholars they explain. They say that what this what this really means or what this uh, statement means is that that it explains that what gives rise to an action is the intention right right so in other words what the, what, what they are basically saying is that when a person has an intention right that intention arises initially in his heart and then eventually that will result in an action so in other words no action was performed by anybody except that he had a desire for it and an intent for it and this is obviously the same as the niya right so in other words what, what these what this other group of scholars are saying is that this hadith basically is explaining how do actions arise what are the causes of actions the causes of actions um, so whether these actions are righteous whether these actions are evil or corrupt 
or whether these actions constitute obedience or disobedience, then what this, what, what this, the second group, what they are saying is that <coughs> irrespective of what the action is, the hadith is just explaining that all actions, irrespective of what they are, they arise as a result of an intention and a desire that is found in uh, the heart of a person. And uh, so this is what they say. And so what they, they say that when the heart desires an action and the person has the ability to do it, then indeed the action will occur. And so they say that this statement of the messenger, إِنَّمَا الْأَعْمَالُ بِالنِّيَاتِ It just simply means, it just simply means that the messenger is explaining that the causal a relationship or the link between intentions and actions. Right, the actions are caused by intentions, uh, and this is the view of the um, uh, the you know the second uh, group of scholars. However, what is correct is what is correct is the first statement, which you know which is which is that the which is that actions are judged. According to the intentions behind them, um, the Sheikh explains that this is the, the, the correct viewpoint and the correct uh, opinion, and uh, this is because the intent behind this, the intent behind this hadith is is an explanation of what the Sharia desires or what the Sharia requests. Right, the Sharia requests from us that we make our actions sincerely and purely for the sake of Allah. This hadith is an explanation of that, and. You know, the hadith isn't just merely something that, because we know already, we, we already know, for example, that a person's actions arise as a result of him desiring them, right? All actions arise because of that. We already know that. We already know that reality and that this is, this, this is the case. So it would be redundant for this hadith to be just, you know, to, for the messenger system to, 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 to just mention this as a statement of fact. It wouldn't make any any, any sense. Rather, the what, what what is correct or the correct view is that, the statement of the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is from the angle of explaining that actions are judged by the intentions uh, behind them. So now that, we, now that we've correctly established the intended meaning behind this statement then exactly what are the actions? What exactly are the actions then? Al-A'mal Al-A'mal is the plural of Amal. A'mal, actions, is the plural of am, Amal, the single, uh, the singular form, action. And what it refers to is everything that arises from a person, every single action. So it would include statements and it would include actions. Right? So everything which, which emanates from a person, whether they are statements or whether they are actions, whether it is the statement of the heart, speech of the heart, or action of the heart, whether it is a statement of the tongue, or whether it is actions of the limbs, then a'mal referred to here in the hadith, then all of it enters into that. All of it enters into that. So the Shaykh says that when the Messenger وسلم, said, إِنَّمَا الْأَعْمَالُ بِالنِّيَاتِ Then everything that is connected to Iman, everything which is connected to Iman. Iman, as we know, is speech, belief, speech and action. Speech is speech of the heart and speech of the tongue. An action is action of the heart and action of the limbs. Then all of that enters into al-a'mal as occurs in this hadith, because iman, as the Sheikh says, uh, iman, qawlun wa amalun is speech and action. Qawlun lisani wa qawlun qalb, qawlun lisani wa qawlun qalb, speech of the tongue and speech of the heart, and the action of the limbs and the action of the heart. So therefore, everything which emanates from a person enters into the statement إِنَّمَا الْأَعْمَالُ بِالنِّيَاتِ and then uh, the Sheikh says that now that we've established obviously the 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 niyyah and the actions and all of the actions then we, we've attached the niyyah to the heart and the place of the niyyah isn't the tongue for example or the, or the limbs uh, rather the place where the intention is found is the heart Right, so basically what it means is, what exactly is the, is the niyyah? It means that the heart intends and desires something or this thing with, with, with the heart. That is what the intention is defined as. Right, so a person, he intends and wills and, or he intends and desires to perform the salah. That, that then now is the intention. 
That is the intention. That that is what we call the intention, the the, the, the intent and the desire, the qasd and the irada in his heart to perform the salah. Just the existence of that intent and desire. That is what is called intention. That is the intention. It's not something, for example, that a person he says with his tongue that I now intend to pray the uh, salatul dhuhr with four rakat. This is not what is intention. You know, so intention isn't that something that's on the tongue, nor is it something that's uh, in the limbs, rather it's it's that which is in the heart when a person intends and desires something then his niya is established. The niya for that thing is then present, existent and it becomes established. So <clears throat> so therefore now, now, now what becomes clear from the hadith then is that all of the actions all of the actions have a condition which is the presence of the niya, the presence of the intention and now that we've established the uh, intention, now that we've established the uh, the presence of the intention, the next question is, uh, what what is it that a person is seeking? What what is it that a person is intending? Right. So we've established that the intention must be there, but what what is the nature of that intention? What, what is it? And the answer to it is that what is intended by it is to seek the face of Allah, the mighty and majestic. To seek the face of Allah, the mighty and majestic. And this is why in the Quran we find that the word niyyah itself, it comes, it, it, the, the word niyyah itself, uh, it comes in a number of different words. For example, al irada and for example, al ibtiga. We find that this is how niyyah is referred to in the Quran. So some examples of that the Shaykh gives, first of all, the saying of Allah the Most High, Yuriduna Wajh Allah. So Allah says that they seek and they desire the face of Allah. Uh, Surah Rum, Surah 30, verse 38. And likewise, the saying of Allah the Most High, Yuriduna Wajh, that they seek His face. Again, the word Yuridun, the word Irada. Surah Al An'am, Surah 6, verse 52. And likewise, the saying of Allah, وَاصْبِرْ نَفْسَكَ مَعَ الَّذِينَ يَدْعُونَ رَبَّهُمْ بِالْغَدَاتِ وَالْعَشِيِّ يُرِيدُونَ وَجْهَهِ Have patience with those who call upon their Lord in the, uh, in the, the morning and even, evening, in the morning and night, and they, they seek His face. Surah Al-Kahf, Surah 18, verse 28. And other similar verses. You know, other similar verses. Man kana, man kana yuridu harth al-akhirah, nazid lahu fi harthihi. That whoever desires the tilth of the hereafter, then we will increase him in his tilth. Right? Again, yurid. Man kana yurid. Uh, so, in the first set of hadith, we find seeking Allah's face. And in this set of hadith, we find seeking the hereafter. Right, so yurid meaning the person who intends and seeks and desires. Right, and another verse, woman arad al akhirat wa sa'alaha sa'yaha. That whoever desires the hereafter and strives for it as it truly should be striven for. Again, this is niyyah. This is Surah Al Isra, Surah 17, verse 19. And the verse before that, that I just mentioned about the tilth, whoever desires the tilth of the hereafter. Surah Surah Al Shura, Surah 42. Verse 20. Right, so all of these verses, when they, when they speak about seeking the face of Allah or seeking the hereafter, then all of this is in reference to the niyyah. This is the niyyah. And also the word al ibtigha. Ibtigha can be used as well. So we have irada and we have ibtigha. So Allah the Mighty Majestic says, illa ibtigha a wajhi rabbihi al a'la. Which is, except seeking the face of his Lord. The Most High, Surah Al-Layl, uh, the Surah Al-Layl, which I believe is Surah 91 or 92, uh, verse number 20. And likewise, in another verse, لا خير في كثير من نجواهم إلا من أمر بصدقة أو معروف أو إصلاح بين إصلاح بين بين الناس ومن يفعل ومن يفعل ذلك بتغاء مرضات الله فسوف نعطيه أجرا عظيما. That there's no goodness in many of their secret councils, the secret meetings, except for the one who commands with charity, or with uh, with goodness, or who rectifies between the people. And whoever does that, seeking the pleasure of Allah, then soon shall we give him a great reward. Uh, 
So this is Surah Surah Al-Nisa, Surah 4, verse 114. And again, the word ibtigha used here, seeking the pleasure of Allah, again, the mean that, that refers to uh, the niyyah. So therefore, uh, we find that in these texts that we've given by way of example, we find that the word niyyah or the meaning of niyyah comes often either in terms of the irada, meaning the heart's uh, uh, desiring something, the irada, or with the word al-ibtigha, which is the same, al-ibtigha, meaning to seek or to desire. Sometimes it can also come with the word uh, islam, meaning aslama, like in the Quran, man aslama wajhahu, wajhahu lillah, you know, like for example, uh, t turning one's heart or submitting one's heart or face to Allah, right? So it comes in all these different ways we find it in the Quran, and all of that is in reference to the niyyah. This is the niyyah. Then the next issue is the, the niyyah itself is divided into two types. Right? So when we find the word niyyah used in the speech of Allah, the mighty majestic, Oh, but when you find it being used in the Sharia in general, then this niya, it, it, there, there are one of two meanings which are intended by it. <clears throat> the first niya is the niya which is directed towards ibadah, towards actions of worship, towards ibadah. And secondly, the niya which is directed towards al ma'bud, meaning the one being worshipped. Right. So we look at niya from two different angles. A niya as it relates to the actions of worship, a niya as it relates to the one being worshipped. So as for the first, the niya which is attached to the actions of worship, then this is this is what is used predominantly by the fuqaha, the jurists, when they speak about in the rulings and when they bring, for example, the conditions. That when they say, for example, that the condition for an action or for a worship is a niya first of all. The niyyah that they're talking about here is the niyyah that is directed towards the actions of worship. What does it mean? This means, <clears throat> all it means is to distinguish the actions of worship from each other. Right? So, for example, uh, you know, it's the niyyah that distinguishes between uh, prayer and charity and between, you know, uh, the, the, the prayer which is obligatory and the prayer which is nafal, not obligatory. The, the niyyah which separates between, for example, Salatul Dhuhr and Salatul Asr because Dhuhr and Asr outwardly are exactly the same. What's the difference between them in terms of physically performing the actions of worship? The only thing that distinguishes them is, aside from the time in which they prayed, is the niyyah. A person intends his niyyah is to pray Dhuhr and a person intends his niyyah is to pray Asr. Right, so the niyyah, one of the roles and the functions of the niyyah is to distinguish between the various acts of worship. Right, between uh, you know like these, these these prayers as we've said and other than them so this is when we speak of niyyah from this angle then you know this is this is what is spoken of by the jurists in their books and this is the niyyah that allows the heart to distinguish between one worship and another uh, worship you know like a person comes he comes to a mosque and he wants to pray two rakahs uh, in his heart you know, it's his heart that distinguished by way of the intention, it's his heart that's distinguished these two rakahs as being the rakahs of, you know, greeting the masjid, the tahiyatul masjid, right? Or are they, or are they the uh, two rakahs which are from the rawatib, you know, from the, from the uh, prayers that you pray along with the obligatory prayers, you know? Um, so it's, it's, it's the heart that distinguishes between these various types and forms of uh, worship. So the heart distinguishing between one type of worship and another, this is also called the niya, and this is what is spoken of by the fuqaha, by the jurists in their books when they speak about you know the affairs of fiqh and you know the conditions of some the, the performing the obligations and things like that. The second type, which is the niya that's directed towards the one being worshipped, then this is what we often refer to using the word ikhlas. Right? So when we speak of ikhlas, ikhlas al niyyah lillah, ikhlas al qalb, ikhlas al deen, ikhlas al amal, you know, making the, the niyyah, uh, being sincere to Allah, making the deen sincere to Allah, making action sincere to Allah, then this is 
what we speak of commonly when we speak of, of ikhlas and you know tawheed and so on and so forth and so these are the two types and this hadith when we look at this hadith which of the two is this hadith referring to the answer is that the hadith in fact comprises both types the wording and the hadith comprises both types uh, so the, the niyyah which is directed towards the one being worshipped in the sense that a person's actions are only for his sake and the niyyah also in the, in the sense that, it distinct, that, it's, that, that which distinguishes between some affairs of worship from, from others and so it comprises uh, both of these uh, affairs and with that uh, we inshallah will stop today's lesson and we'll continue with the remainder in the next lesson, inshallah ta'ala, we'll find, finish the remainder of the hadith in the next lesson. So uh, with that, we will close today's lesson, inshallah ta'ala.